All right. Good morning. All right. I'm Rachel Frick. I'm the executive director of the Research Library Partnership, and I'm here with my colleagues, Chip and Kathy. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about the OCLC open content and what OCLC has been doing. And kind of, I'm here to give you a little bit of the, the storytelling in the past and talk about the strategy and where we sit in the ecology of the open content movement. And then Chip is going to talk a little bit more about our strategy and what we're doing around collection building and overall informing what our philosophy is at OCLC, and then Kathy's going to wrap us up with some really detailed um, ideas about what we're doing with product development in that area. And we're hopefully going to have about 15 minutes for in-depth questions, and I hope as you listen to us talk, you jot down some questions that you want or some challenges you think OCLC, where OCLC should be in this really exciting movement for libraries. So... I'll talk to you a little bit about how we were framing the discussion. Open content conversations have been going on in library communities for a, a long extended period of time. We started hearing about this during the serials crisis in the late 90s as we were talking about um, doing uh, self-publishing, pre-publishing, and but it has really gained momentum in the last, I think, the last five to 10 years, especially with changes in specifically in the scientific publishing ecosystem, as we're seeing a really hard shift from paywall to open access due to national mandates and funder mandates. And libraries, as a result, are now expected by our researchers, by our communities, by our funders, and especially our end users to provide services that support open materials and the workflows that support those materials as fully as the content that we pay for our license. Recognizing this trend, the Global Council expressed an interest in exploring the impact and use of open content in libraries. And it really seemed like an opportune time to engage in a dialogue with our members globally about what are our opinions, our ideas, the issues and challenges in this area of growing importance. So for us, we try to broaden this conversation as far as possible. We defined open content as a full range of freely available, unrestricted online content, and that's pretty broad. That included OA scientific articles, ebooks, preprints, open educational resources, government and non-government publications, gray literature, etc. And it's you know basically that very large gamut. And there are several areas, I would say, of the open access movement. You know, there's open access specifically, there's what we call open content, we talk about open data, open education, open infrastructure, and open scholarship, and open science. There's so much. But we felt at OCLC and with the advisement from Global Council that in order for this conversation to be successful, in order for OCLC to really hone in on what our strategy should be, we needed to choose what our strategic areas were. Whereas what you think open access is exclusively concerned with research publications, making them openly available, we wanted this to be this larger trend um, around making public sector and scholarly information more easily available and reusable in the digital environment. We really wanted to focus on improving the end user experience around open content. So, and, and in doing so, we wanted to see what this impact of thinking about the end user, how it impacts libraries who have a role in managing and providing access. So we did two things. We thought about first, you know, how do we scope this conversation so everybody's on the same page about what we mean by open content, how we define it, and how we structure that conversation. We wanted to hear the voices from all types of libraries around the globe, and we wanted to gather different perspectives and be inclusive. Open content is relevant to all libraries, and we wanted them to join in this global conversation. We wanted to take a high-level view and basically look across those different types of silos where we see open content, whether it's in institutional repositories, digitized cultural heritage collections, 
open educational resources collections, open data repositories, et cetera. We wanted to hear from all these different types of libraries in these different regions how this content and how the activity around the content was affecting them and their, their users. But we wanted to know why we were doing this. And our main aim was to engage this global audience of librarians to join in this joint exercise of a survey to map and align their open content activities in order to cultivate a shared understanding of how much the library community has already invested in this type of content and workflows and how we can work together effectively to leverage these efforts. And where could OCLC play a part? So the survey was launched in November of last year and it was open for three months. It was quite an intensive survey, because as you can guess, as we were trying to keep this at a high level, as we were trying to go across all these different, um, I would say, ecosystems of open content that tend to be in different operational silos in our organizations. Um, I talked to one person who filled out the survey, although it took them about 30 minutes to manually input the information into the survey, it took them about two weeks to gather the information. So that gives you an idea of, she had to go to different departments, like her scholarly communications department, her digitization department, in order to answer a lot of these questions. But even though this was a challenging survey to, to complaints, we had over 705 responses from 82 countries, and we actually a large part of that was from research libraries. Needs to say, the key findings from this research was that interest in an OA or dedication or attention is growing. The support of providing access to open materials is strong. But there was this need for assessment. What are we, you know, we're doing things, but what are we doing? How are we counting? How are we measuring that impact? There was a need for this advocacy, for data policies, but at scale. But at right now, people tend to be acting locally and not really using their networks to address the challenges around open content. And that we identified that there is some research that needs to be happening around discoverability and standardization around the metadata that describes open content. For each open content activity in, that we highlighted in the survey, less than 20% of the respondents indicated that OCLC supports them in this activity today. And we see this around 19% was around promoting discovery of open content, and another high-level activity was selecting open content not managed by my library. But more than half the respondents do see a role for OCLC to support them, and that's around deep interactions of open content around their digital collections and an assessment. Once again, this is where OCLC's most, where we were challenged by our community, where we, they, we felt were most relevant areas of research in this particular area. Definitely around discoverability, standardization of metadata was called out several times. And then, of course, around the challenges around special collections and archives, and a lot of that conversation was how we express rights and reuse, optimizing resource sharing of open content, and then, of course, um, the challenges of linked data. How do we create context around this open content? So now that we had all this information, what are we going to do? <laughs> so it was really... Um, eye-opening to get this global conver uh, data through this survey. And because we had over 72% of the respondents coming from the academic research libraries, we got a really good um, a signal from that community. And we also had strong signals because we had, uh, I would say, representative data from the Netherlands, from the US and Canada, from the Australia region. So we have a really clear picture of what's how open content is affecting those regions. So for us, it helps us you know, align our research priorities, but also create some challenge conversations for us within OCLC. So what are we doing? Open content is an integral part of OCLC's product strategy in support of libraries, and we're working towards privileging this open content. 
We are increasing the open content from library collections, such as institutional repositories, and through partnerships with leading publishers and aggregators that Chip's gonna to talk to you about a little bit later. We're also intentionally integrating open content into worldcat.org and other OCLC services, like WorldCat Discovery and in our WorldCat knowledge base. Just an example, one of our core products is Oyster, which is a union catalog of millions of records that represent open access resources. This catalog was built through harvesting from open collections worldwide using the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. That's hard for me to say because I usually say OAIPMH and people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Today, Oyster has over 50 million records that represent digital resources from over 2,000 contributors. And that content is synced through OCLC's digital collection gateway, and that digital collections gateway content is pushed towards worldcat.org. So just to give you an idea, all those harvested open resources then get integrated into WorldCat, which is open to, is an open um, resource for anybody to use. The other challenge that was given to us was to support libraries um, around standards around, and metadata around open content. And it was highlighted that there needs to be some mark record improvement in order to communicate on a machine actionable level what's open, what's not. That might seem simple, um, but actually that's quite hard because our catalog records are, most of them are created by people. And we didn't have a designated field in the mark record to say is something open or not. Um, and we also don't have a machine consistent way to say rights around a particular open content. Something might be open, but there might be some additional rights information that has to be um, consulted. So we worked with the um, MARC editorial board and did several different iterations of proposals, the last one being with the German National Library, to change the standards so that we could indicate in a consistent way, in a machine actionable way, when resources are open. And I'm happy to say that that passed all the requirements in June of this past year. So now we're working within our, our organization to enrich our current database to have these indicators. For those of you who deal with large masses of data, you know this is a routine that can last days, weeks, months in order to enrich those data, those, those fields with that. But I'm happy to say we're on our way and we're thinking of new strategies on how to improve this. Um, the German National Library, the one field that they're working on, I think it's the 506 and the 540. That's coming in right later. I'm looking at Kathy. Okay. We're also working on ways on how we can represent rights. So when I talk about that, that's the Creative Commons um, URIs that indicate different rights levels for things that actually have licenses and for things that can't have um, licensed rights. We're also looking at things, uh, we call them right statements that were developed by Europeana and DB Light. So this kind of, when we think about what's happening in the open content landscape, this definitely has um, an impact or effect on how libraries are changing the way they're collecting. How many people have heard about the inside out collection that Lorcan talks about all the time? Okay, we got a few ones. So traditionally libraries brought the world in, the outside in. And now today libraries are pushing what we're creating on our campuses, especially in research libraries, out to the world, that unique content whether it's content that's in our institutional repositories, the support of our authors and producers, we, libraries and working with our university presses are actually publishing open content, so we're publishers. So if we're looking about the inside out, libraries and our communities that we serve are actually creators of open content and we're, the role here is us is pushing that content out. So the motivators and how we digitize those materials, how we organize them and describe them, how we provide links to access of those, we're thinking about how they connect with the larger web. So think about those open strategies and what we're doing. The facilitated collection, this is where we're bringing and, and, and highlighting, Lorcan likes to say, we think about libguides, how we're collecting material and how we're indicating resources to the people that we serve about materials that we may not own. And this is something that's really interesting 
about how libraries are doing curatorial responsibilities and workflows for content. Because it's open, it's residing in another institution. They don't physically own it, but it's really important to show and highlight where this material is residing elsewhere. Um, I actually saw an advertisement for a metadata position at a large uh, university library in California for the first ever open content metadata a cataloger, which I thought was a, a nice indicator of this trend of libraries are now intentionally curating, collecting, describing content that they don't license, bring in, or traditionally acquire through that acquisitions workflow. <coughs> And then lastly, in this space, is the collective collection. So things that you don't own, but you have a networked responsibility. So I'm thinking about open content that maybe um, for a local, um, I would say the Greater Western Library Alliance here in the region, what collections do they own together that they digitize together, that they work together? What open content pools that they think are strategically important and how they bring these things together or invest in? So that's basically the landscape and how we're working at OCLC. And I am going to hand things over to Chip to talk a little bit further. Good morning. Good morning. Mike's OK. Um, so I was at a session yesterday, and the speaker was commenting that they were wearing the jacket that was in their photo. I'm pleased to see that I'm not wearing that jacket. I, w I will tell you, though, that it was an old jacket, and when they took the photo, they had to use banker's clasps to make it a little tighter in the back. So I was sitting there smiling, but I was feeling a bit uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually uh, um, uh, representing the work of Susanna Kemperman, who works in the business development team and leads up our efforts to synchronize our data platform with uh, open content. Um, happy to do that. Uh, I'm sure that... Uh, um, that uh, she would do a, a bit better job than I, but I'll try to live up to her standards. So I think that I think the main the the main thread for us in the exercise that Rachel described is it, at OCLC for years we have synchronized WorldCat and more recently our data platform. And I say that intentionally because people think OCLC equals WorldCat, and I I I work with publishers all the time. We know that to enable access to a library collection, you have to, sure, the, the records for the books and journals, et cetera, need to be in WorldCat. You also have to have the article level metadata in the central index. It's four billion items now or some crazy number. We don't count, it's like McDonald's, I think. Uh, and then you've got the knowledge base, which contains the inventory statements about the collections that you've purchased or that you've created for yourself with the corresponding holdings information, library information, and then finally, uh, and not least importantly, of authentication data. For us, that means easy proxy stanzas, which are metadata that is created both by libraries and by publishers. So when we face the content supply chain, whether it's open content, closed content, whatever, we're looking to synchronize across all of that to automate your workflows, whether it's cataloging or discovery or what have you. Um, the other thing that I think is important to talk about is uh, Lorcan Dempsey. Because uh, Lorcan Dempsey is there. Oh, wait a minute. Is this me? This is me. So, um, yeah, this is me. Yeah, I'm good. OK. So the purpose of this slide is uh, I did practice. I did. You'll find out later. Um, the purpose of this slide is just to show the growth in open access content. I think this is something we all see. I mean. Uh, and, and it really has, as Rachel said, uh, accelerated in the past few years. I think when we started getting interested in open content, that was during the emergence of the large digital libraries. So that was, you know, remember the days of Google Books and how exciting that was and, and um, the Hathi Trust and, and the Internet Archive. And we dutifully uh, partnered with all of those organizations and synchronized so that that metadata could be found and used um, through our platform. But more recently, we've seen um, publishers really beginning to work in the area, and we've seen new forms of content aggregators emerge, some of which I'll, I'll talk about. So now back to Lorcan Dempsey, which was the point of my talk. So Lorcan and his team, about 10 or 15 years ago, developed something called the Collections Grid. I find it a very useful framework for thinking about library collections, and it informs the work we do on my team in terms of aggregating uh, access to content 
um, for our data platform. So here's a quiz. Kathy always makes fun of me because I use the Socratic method so often. I promised her I wouldn't, but I just can't help it. So what percentage of the content that we bring into OCLC every year comes from libraries versus partners of various kinds? Who would, who would care to venture a guess? <laughs> Come on. You know you already have a number in your head. Just say it. Okay, it's 13%. 13% for WorldCat comes from partners. For the um, central index, it's about 100%. The knowledge base is probably 90%. And, and I'm sure that um, easy proxy is equally high. So what we're finding is that we increasingly need to be out scouting the universe and, taking, uh, and, and thinking of curating collections within our data platform, which is new. And I think, Rachel, when you were talking, that's kind of what we learned when we opened up this project to begin looking at the work we'd done in open content is that we actually needed a collection development policy at OCLC for ag aggregating the content, and, and we wanted to try to do it in a way that met the needs of um, the libraries that we serve. So the collections grid is a good device for thinking about it. It has uh, two um, axes. The vertical axis is rarity. So at the bottom, it's something that's in few collections. At the top, it's many collections. And then stewardship. Over on the left, it's low stewardship. On the right, it's high stewardship. So if we walk around it, the published materials, whether they're physical or digital, books, journals, et cetera, those are going to be high stewardship, but they're also in many collections. Lots of libraries buy content from EBSCO, Elsevier, et cetera. That has traditionally been our focus, ours at OCLC and the libraries we serve. Then we have special collections, local digitization. This is, let me see if I get this right, Rachel. This is the inside out collection. Yes, very good, Chip. Well done. Uh, the Inside Out Collection, where we're helping libraries to uh, promote the fact that they have special collections by making them available on our data platform for use through our services or other services the libraries might use. Research and learning materials is an even newer area. We've done a little bit of work here recently around open educational materials. Who has um, a program on campus related to OEMs today? Who's Who's, yeah, I hear that all the time, that there's money and the provost or the dean wants to, what can we do? So we started looking into that. And then finally, open, act, open web resources. So when we think about curating a collection of open content, we think about moving systematically from quadrant to quadrant. Um, and that is, that is kind of what we do. The, the other thing that I think is worth spending just a moment on is the notion of the outside in versus the inside out collection, which Rachel mentioned. There's also the facilitated collection. I'm not going there. I think it's really good I got these two um, on a slide. But the reason this is important to me is that you have OCLC with, its, with, with the libraries it serves working hand in hand to build an aggregation of open content. So on the top, you've got OCLC working, at, working with all of the usual suspects, be it a publisher or an aggregator or somebody who's curating uh, a directory of open access content, DOAJ, DOAB, et cetera. On the bottom, you have libraries who, for their own reasons, are looking to promote the fact that they have special collections, they've invested in digitizing them, and they're uploading them to our platform uh, uh, to share with the world. So these two work symbiotically, and I think as we go forward, figuring out that path is going to be really important for us. So um, I'll start with the upper right quadrant. Um, you can see it there. Um, would somebody like to read the text in the blue box? In the I can't, I can't read it. Um, but, it's, but that's a nice device to remind you where we are in the collections grid. So OCLC partners with about 360 different publishers, thousands of imprints, right? And we have done that for years and years and years to bring their content in. What we make sure to do, do over the last several years is get their open access content. As Rachel mentioned, it's difficult to know which is open access and which is, isn't. But I think, Kathy, you're going to talk a little bit about that. But we make sure to bring that in. And I think Susanna told me about 150,000 um, peer-reviewed STM and open access articles. So that will remain you know, a really important part of the project. Um, the next part is a little more recent. Down at the bottom, you've got kind of some of the old standards, HathiTrust, Internet Archive, you know, the, the organizations that broke ground in this area years ago. Um, Project Gutenberg, you know, et cetera. We work with them. There's Oyster, which Rachel mentioned. Up above, you have some more recent uh, efforts. Uh, uh, primary among them, from our point of view, DOAB, DOAJ, because they're curated collections of peer-reviewed content 
that we can easily, and they, they, they work at uh, high standards with their metadata, so it's easy for us to integrate it. So we've integrated that. And then you've got some other, and I think we have 20 or so of these collections that we're integrating um, on a regular basis. So the question I always ask, and I think that when Susanna put this slide together, she was teasing me indirectly. I say, but Susanna, what's the universe of content? Because what we're talking about, so we've got the open content universe here, um, and it's difficult. And this is one of the things that we're addressing now is how much open content do we have? Well, from publishers and aggregators, that's the upper right quadrant, about 150K records. The open access providers, uh, uh, about 50 million. Digital libraries, 52 million. Library created about 73 million. And I think we've got a couple thousand institutional repositories that we've integrated. So it is a significant um, part of the content in our platform. Uh, and now we're in the uh, process of mobilizing it. Uh, and to that regard, uh, there are two projects that I'd like to mention. One is something uh, that we call cleverly at OCLC the open content filter. Uh, and that's a filter for open content. Yeah, that's what it is. And uh, it's a combination of uh, Unpaywall. We have a partnership with Unpaywall, and we use their metadata to link to the, o the open content. But it's also uh, the collections that we've integrated that we know are 100% open access. The, the, the total content that's accessible, uh, and Kathy, you'll talk about how that works, right? through our discovery services. Well, okay, well, the uh, 61 million, you can go into, fir go into uh, First Search, you can go into Open World Cat, you can access that content with a filter. We couldn't do that a year ago, is that right? So um, that's, a, that's a step forward, a positive step forward. The other thing that's important to note is that the knowledge base is, is curated both by libraries and by OCLC. We're reaching out to publishers, but libraries are in there all the time. There are 420 open access con uh, content collections in the knowledge base. Many of those were created by libraries who wanted to build a collection of content across suppliers either to download through record manager or collection manager for local use or to surface in, in their discovery system or what have you. So that, that, work, uh, that work will go on. And uh, I think that is it. Huh? That's me? OK. So um, a, couple of, a couple of future models uh, that we are looking to support, uh, the move from pay, to read, from pay to read to pay to publish models. Uh, so we're looking at the workflow of that. I know Mary Sour Games and the product team are uh, very interested in modeling that workflow and thinking about how that might come into play in our platform. Uh, and then I think the last point that I'll make is uh, that where I started, that, that our goal is to curate a collection of this content that matches your needs so that you can trust OCLC as a source for an aggregated collection of open content so that you don't have to go out and do that work yourself. It's another way that we think we can, we can support your workflow and save you time. And learning and digitized. This, I mentioned this earlier. We, uh, so this is the lower left quadrant, the, the yellow one, the open textbook network. We recently signed an agreement to integrate their metadata into World, WorldCat because as we've done our surveys and talked to the membership, we have heard repeatedly of the growth of this area. It isn't clear to me what our role to play is in this area. Um, often these initiatives seem to be done uh, at the level of the provost with assistance from the library. So you know, maybe in, maybe in the discussion we can get to some of that. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Kathy King. Okay, I was gonna say good afternoon, but I don't think it's the afternoon yet. Good morning, everybody. So uh, as um, Chip mentioned, we've been sort of collecting or aggregating uh, open access content for a while. We had um, Rachel come up and talk a little bit about what the community expects OCLC to do. So I've sort of wanted to end here to give a few examples of what we've been up to from a product perspective. So I represent a really fantastic product team. Chip mentioned his team back home and that my product team could probably do a little bit better of a job here, but I will try my best to represent the great work that they've been doing for the last year and a half or so to integrate open content, open access into our products. So what I wanted to start with is to talk a little bit, a little bit about your end users. So Rachel mentioned that when we did the survey, one of the things at the top of that survey was you all would like us to pay attention to how to make open content more discoverable. 
I don't remember what the percentage was, but it was pretty high. Please help us. So when we went out and started to talk to the community and libraries, we wanted to know a little bit about what that meant to you all. Um, and in the product organization, we really don't do anything without at least talking to one library and a couple of end users. You know, we really want to partner with you to make sure we're incorporating enhancements into our services and products that work for you. And what we heard over and over again is that one of the challenges as it relates to discovery is your end users have this expectation of now. So they have this expectation driven by the experiences that they use outside the library. Uh, experiences like Google and Amazon are sort of raising the bar, um, really driving this expectation of I can get anything, anytime, anywhere. Has anybody heard this? A little bit. So I like to turn my uh, audiences into a focus group. So <laughs> I, I think you, you have a lot of interesting things to say. So this was really important. Um, so we thought when we started with discovery, we better keep the end user in mind. And I wanted to share this slide. This came up over and over again. This isn't my slide. I've borrowed this uh, slide. You might have seen it. It's come up in a couple of um, different presentations. So one presentation that I first became aware of this slide was Char Booth. She was uh, a guest speaker at OCLC. We have a Distinguished Seminar Speaker Series. It's not easy to say, but I've been practicing it. Um, where we invite thought leaders into OCLC and we uh, stream their um, interesting topics so that you can either come to OCLC if you're in Dublin, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, or you can watch them online. And you can also go back in time and watch the speakers that have come to OCLC. And Char came and talked a little bit about open content and information privilege. And this was one of the slides that really struck me. She talked about uh, what these bubbles are. What you're seeing is uh, use of Sci-Hub, um, where people actually had access to the content legally, but they were accessing, accessing it illegally. And the reason um, that we're seeing some of this, she hypothesized, was because it's really convenient. It's really easy to just go and kind of get something off uh, uh, online and uh, quickly download it. So she said that we're competing with illegal convenience and she actually, she had a really strong call to action to the product team. She said um, to an OCLC audience with a lot of product members, please go back to your desk and help us figure out how to overcome this challenge. It's a very strong call to action that combined with the survey um, and the fact that we already had a lot of really great content was an input into where we started uh, for our products and services. So, Kind of coming out of this dialogue, we thought as we approach incorporating open access into our discovery products, that's where we wanted to start, we wanted to think about the end user and sort of this, we wanted to have these pillars. So later today, Lynn Conaway and I will talk a little bit about um, some end user research that she's done and she talks a lot about delightful experiences. So Lynn Conaway is on Lorcan Dempsey's team and she studied end users globally. She's studied everybody from, I think, kindergarten all the way up in um, all ages. And she talks about how we, the bar should be uh, creating delightful experiences for our users so that they are easy to use, you know, convenient, and that people want to essentially come to the library. Um, so that's kind of at the base of the pyramid. Of course, we want to promote intuitive discovery when we're talking about open content. But the other piece that was really important to our strategy was to think about fulfillment. It wasn't enough to really just find a record that was open, but we want to provide access to that record, which is kind of an important nuance. So this has come up a couple of times. So um, what I want to share are a couple of examples how we've incorporated, how we've started to incorporate open content into our um, products. This is worldcat.org. And as I was listening to Doug this morning, I was thinking about worldcat.org. I'm very passionate about .org. Uh, the reason I'm passionate about this is because we can do things with worldcat.org that we can't do alone. So um, just this is a sidebar for .org, side commercial. Um, so .org, we get millions of people to .org per year. Um, because of WorldCat.org and the fact that it's sort of this global library catalog, we are able to partner with all kinds of unique, um, uh, not unique, but large scale operations like Goodreads and Google, Etc. So anyway, so you've got millions of people coming to the site and we recently surveyed them and we found a lot of lifelong learners are coming to worldcat.org. 
So what we wanted to do was make it easy for them to find access that uh, uh, content that was open access and free. So we've uh, installed this, this filter and that's really just the first step. We are looking at a modernization of this, um, this site, which open will I think will be very important uh, go forward in the design. Has anyone used worldcat.org recently? Yeah, cool. Good, so more to come there. Uh, the other thing that Chimp mentioned was the unpaywall relationship. So this is WorldCat Discovery. Uh, WorldCat Discovery is usually um, packaged along with our ILS offering, WMS. And the, I mentioned smart fulfillment being a, an important part of this strategy. So again, not enough to just surface this content, but we want to provide really good, reliable links to users. So unpaywall, we looked across um, a variety of different partners and selected a to go with um, partnering with Unpaywall so we could get access to, I think it's 24 million links or something like that, really good links so that when a user finds an open access record that they can actually go ahead and get to the full text pretty easily. So those are a couple of things that we've been working on. And so again, we started with discovery because that's where the survey said to start. Uh, I want to talk just one little note about resource sharing going into the future. So I think resource sharing came up as the fourth thing that um, the community wanted us to pay attention to. So we are uh, inspired often by some of the community um, products that are out there. So has anyone used the OA button or instant ILL? Has anyone heard about that? No, okay, so it's a browser plugin. You can put this on your browser and then as you're using the internet, as typically an end user, you can um, essentially request something from the library through interlibrary loan. And now they've started to incorporate this idea of, oh, well, by the way, you can get um, access to it because this is open access. So here's a really quick, convenient way to get access to something. So we are uh, inspired by this solution and we have talked to them and we're gonna start to incorporate this idea into our own request forms. So if you're thinking very detailed, right? You mentioned detailed, WorldShare ILL or Tapasa or Iliad and you've got a request form for something, why not surface right then and there the link to the user um, so that they don't necessarily have to wait for ILL if it's available to them right away. So that's something we're working on from a resource sharing perspective. <coughs> oh. Wow, that's new. <laughs> it's a surprise uh, image in my slides. So, so also going forward, I don't know what's going on there. Um, <laughs> I practiced, I promise. Um, so going forward, the other thing that we're, we're working to do, Rachel alluded to this, is um, using that new MARC standard that just got passed and, and helping to identify more really good quality links because again, getting users, it's important to get users to the thing right away. Um, we don't want that 404 button, that's, that's a very frowny, 404 refers to a dead link, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> okay, so, so just, a, just a really quick taste to, um, or sampling of what we're doing to incorporate open content within our products and services, and Chip really spoke to this really nicely when he was up here. You really can trust OCLC going forward to be your partner, to pay attention to the space, to continue to aggregate this content, uh, create really um, good links and to um, create sustainable solutions for the community. If you're curious about what we have going on, you can follow this URL, oc.lc slash open. I think we have a link to the Char Booth presentation from there. I really recommend it. It's an hour, really fantastic. So we invite you to take a look at that to see more of what we're up to and to stay tuned. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and uh, say thank you and open it up for questions. <laughs>